Hello and welcome to Quantum's Summer Edition, in which we present the highlights of Quantum 89. Over the next ten weeks, I get to take a break and my colleagues share the job of presenting the year's best, beginning with Footprints on the Moon. The moon landing 20 years ago this year had a profound effect, not only on science and space exploration, but also on the way we see ourselves. The pictures beamed back gave us our first distant view of Earth, revealing not the huge, apparently limitless world we experience here on the ground, but a small and surprisingly fragile planet. Geoffrey Birchfield's special report looks at the moon landing, its implications, and the role played by Australian science. This is Apollo 8 uh, coming to you live from the moon. I think that each one of us carries his own impression of what he's seen today. I know my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely, forbidding expanse of nothing. And it certainly would not appear to be a very inviting place to live or work. If that comment from Apollo 8 astronaut Frank Borman was the reality, if the moon was, as he described it, just a vast expanse of nothing, then what was the fascination of going to the moon at all? Why spend 10 years burning up the energies of half a million people? Why use up massive resources, dollars and rubles? And why sacrifice human lives in the race to reach the moon, only to seemingly abandon interest after just three and a half years of manned lunar landings. For the answers, we've got to look back long before Neil Armstrong's One Small Step for a Man. Even to our ancestors, the moon held a special fascination, sometimes supernatural and mystical, sometimes merely romantic, but always influential. The moon's hold over us is very real. Its phases shape the calendar, and control the tides. But although it appears so close, it's remained tantalisingly beyond reach. Like Georges Méliès' 1902 film, we could only fantasise about going there and guess wildly about what we might find. No sooner were the first aeroplanes shakily reaching for the sky than pioneers like Robert Goddard were seriously planning how to reach the moon. The first artificial Earth satellite in the world... With the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957, the race for the moon was on in earnest. But curiosity wasn't the only motive. The Cold War had made the Russians and Americans fiercely competitive, and in the West, the Soviet's success caused some panic. It gets the American people alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this. And it, we fear this. We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Definitely alarmed. What do you think about America not being able to do the same? Well, if I was in military service and fell down on the job like that, I could stand a court-martial. Spurred on by its early technical achievements with Sputnik and the inspiration of chief designer Sergei Korolev, the Russians chalked up a staggering number of firsts in space. I believe, is the normal reaction of every American. I'm disappointed. Ignition. Ignition. 
We can see the ignition. The rocket is beginning to rise agonizingly slowly. The astronaut has turned on his clock. And here we go. We're on our way into space with Alan B. Shepard. I'll join you in just a second on another microphone. Unwittingly, the Soviet supremacy had stung the pride of the richest nation in the world. Less than three weeks after Alan Shepard became America's first man in space, President Kennedy threw down the gauntlet. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Godspeed, John Glenn. It's difficult for us now to realize how incredibly ambitious that goal must have seemed in May of 1961, when America had clocked up only 15 minutes of manned space travel. Oh, that view is tremendous. Uh, Roger, Seven, you have a go, at least seven orbits. As the race intensified, both sides now blasted men into orbit at a dizzying rate, staging one space spectacular after another. In the meantime, over 30 unmanned robot vehicles were rocketed to the moon. But it was too far, too fast. The year 1967 struck crushing blows to both superpowers. Astronauts Virgil I. Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee were killed tonight in a flash fire during tests of the Apollo Saturn 204 vehicle at Cape Kennedy Air Force Base. Then in Russia, Veteran cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov was killed when his new Soyuz spacecraft plunged to Earth, its parachute hopelessly tangled. Just months before, Russia's chief designer, Korolev, and his deputy had died unexpectedly. For the Soviets, the setbacks were too great. The race to put a man on the moon was over. They concentrated instead on developing unmanned lunar vehicles, this left the way open for the Americans to take the one giant leap for mankind. When the moon is in the seventh and as the big event drew near in July 1969, Moon madness set in around the world. Then peace will guide the planets and love will steer the stars. This is the dawning of the age. For the American people, the astronauts and their spacecraft embodied once again the pioneering spirit. But behind the scenes, scientists had their own expectations, ones which they hoped might shed light on the moon's origin. seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6.
Roger, it's up. Tower's gone. Roger, tower. Neil Armstrong confirming both the engine skirt separation and the launch escape tower separation. Yeah, Houston, Apollo 11, that Saturn gave us a magnificent ride. Eagle, Houston, we, Houston, we see you on the stairwell, over. Roger, Eagle, thumb got. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has wings. Roger. Four and a half down. At the last minute down. of the lunar descent, Module pilot Buzz Aldrin had to manoeuvre the Eagle away from a crater full of large boulders. As a result, Mission Control never got an exact fix on their location in the Sea of Tranquility. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The, uh, very, very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. Now, now step off the lamina. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful for radio. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like... 400,000 like kilometres away, an estimated one billion people watched this ghostly radio. figure step onto an alien world. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. And it was, in fact, an Australian facility that allowed Mission Control and the world to see these momentous images. The pictures were received by the NASA tracking station at Honeysuckle Creek in the ACT, and from there they were relayed to Houston. The Honeysuckle Creek station was one of a dozen or so tracking stations around the globe. In Australia, it was supported by dishes at nearby Tidbin Billa and Parks. Tidbin Billa had been planned as the major link, but at the 11th hour, things went wrong. The uh, transmitter power supply at Tidbin Billa blew up before the mission started, and despite the fact that the uh, engineers repaired it very quickly, the managers at Houston decided to switch the support of the lunar module from Tidbin Billa to Honeysuckle. Unconcerned by earthbound problems, Armstrong and Aldrin unfurled the Stars and Stripes, took a phone call from the President, and then began the serious work. Some distance from the Eagle, a solar-powered seismometer was placed on the surface to record moonquakes, a valuable method of determining the structure of the moon's interior. Then Aldrin set up a laser reflector, a cluster of tiny prisms designed to reflect light from laser beams directed onto it from Earth. The time taken for a laser pulse to travel there and back is used to measure the Moon's distance from the Earth. It's accurate to the nearest two centimetres, and we now know that the Moon is actually pulling away from us very slowly. But the most important job was the gathering of rock and soil samples. The two men collected rocks that weighed 22 kilograms back on Earth, the most expensive geological specimens ever obtained. The study of these rocks and others from later Apollo missions was to involve a prominent Australian geochemist. Dr Stuart Ross Taylor of the Australian National University was invited by NASA to run the chemical analysis section of the newly created Lunar Receiving Laboratory at Houston. He was to be the first scientist to analyse the moon rock samples being brought back by Armstrong and Aldrin. NASA had installed an optical emission spectrograph. At that time, the state-of-the-art machine for analysing even tiny fragments of rock, a technique with which Dr Taylor was very familiar. NASA uh, installed this equipment uh, because it wasn't clear how much material was coming back uh, perhaps only a, a handful of sample might be might be grabbed, you know, in a, in a, in a quick mission. Uh, Roger, our guidance recommendation uh, is you're cleared for takeoff. Port stage, engine arm ascent, 
After eight exhausting days in space, now came the laborious safety precautions designed to ensure that no organisms, harmful or otherwise, were brought back from the moon and released on an unsuspecting world. This meant quarantining the astronauts and their sealed boxes of lunar rocks and soil. Naturally, the scientists were eager to see what they'd brought back. What might they reveal about the origin of the moon and our own world? We received the samples at about noon on July the 28th, and there was a press conference at four o'clock when they, we had to put out the first results. Uh, and this was uh, rather traumatic. And since the results had to be correct, were you able to give them any results? Oh, yes, yes, we, and they were correct. <laughs> These initial results confirmed that the lunar rocks were born in great heat and were more ancient than all but the oldest rocks on Earth. 20 years on, the analysis continues. The technology has been updated, but the steps are basically the same. A small piece of moon rock is pulverised, then mixed with graphite and shaped into a pellet that resembles a pencil lead. That pellet is then put into a mass spectrometer and analysed. The photographic plate that results bears the encoded signatures of every element that's present in the sample. In this case, we can see here a, a line duty, uranium-238, thorium-232, some lead isotopes there. Uh, Dr. A, Taylor's findings have made an important contribution to what we know about the moon. Years after the samples were collected, scientists are finally in a position to comment with some certainty about the moon's spectacular origins. Three main theories have been proposed to explain how the moon began. But since the moon landing, only one of them, the so-called giant impact theory, has survived intact. It's based on a new understanding of the chemistry of lunar rocks, coupled with an awareness of the moon's internal structure and its strange orbit. Above all, it explains why the Earth and the moon together spin faster than any other planets in the solar system. The only way to do that was to kick the, give the system a big kick. And the only way to give it a big kick was to hit the Earth with something very big, like the size of Mars, about the tenth of the mass of the Earth. The story goes that eons ago, when the solar system was forming, huge chunks of molten rock orbited the Sun, along with the larger protoplanets themselves. Collisions were inevitable. In fact, according to the theory, they played a crucial part in the formation of the planets as they are today. The most dramatic piece of evidence is uh, Uranus, which is a very large gaseous planet lying on its side with its pole tilted at the sun with, with its satellites in equatorial orbit around it. Uh, it's been knocked over by, and it takes an Earth-sized object to do that for Uranus. Uh, for uh, Venus, uh, Venus is unique, it's rotating slowly backwards. Uh, and uh, the only rational way to do this is to hit it with a very large, probably Mars-sized object. Uh, it stopped in its tracks and starts to spin backwards. In 1987, American astrophysicists Willie Benz, Wayne Slattery and Al Cameron, working from the Los Alamos National Laboratory, reported that they had simulated the ancient impact that may have formed the moon on a Cray supercomputer. The trick was to work out at what speeds the two bodies would have to have been travelling. This is how they saw the events. About 4.6 billion years ago, the proto-Earth and a smaller size planetesimal 
approached each other. Both had iron cores and surrounding mantles of granite. The proto-Earth's gravity pulled the impactor towards it and the collision occurred. The titanic shock of the impact jetted out fiery debris, a ball of molten iron wrapped in a mantle of glowing granite. But the iron core separated and plunged back into the Earth, leaving behind it an orbiting proto-moon made almost entirely of granite. This Los Alamos computer modelling claims to be accurate on a number of points. It produces a mathematical moon that has the same mass, size, orbit and chemical composition as the real moon. What's more, it fits very well the actual data that Apollo brought back from the moon. It's interesting that, uh, that as, as a result of the, this catastrophic collision which took place you know, in a few minutes, four and a half billion years ago, we not only produced the moon, uh, but the Earth gets tilted on its axis. As, you know, it has a 23 degree tilt from the plane of the ecliptic, which of course gives us the seasons. So we have, this single chance event produces both the moon, uh, it alters the chemistry of, of the Earth's rocky mantle, and, and it provides for the coming of spring and autumn and so on as well, all, all of which are the result of a chance encounter uh, four and a half billion years ago. Without the moon missions and the rocks they brought back, it's unlikely we would ever have had the strong evidence to support this theory. And the Russians made a contribution too. Although they abandoned their manned missions, after many attempts, the Soviets finally succeeded with automated soil sample return missions and unmanned lunar rovers. Their performance was impressive, but the Apollo missions proved a far more bountiful source of material. After Apollo 11, nine more missions were on the drawing board, but only five were completed. There were also long-term plans for a moon base, but President Nixon balked at the cost. And when Apollo 17 blasted its way back to Earth, the dream of a permanent presence on the moon faded. 20 years on, the moon is once again out of reach. Neither the Russians nor the Americans have the hardware to get there. The giant Saturn rockets were scrapped years ago, and the shuttle is incapable of leaving Earth orbit. All that remains are the memories of the first astronauts. The, the touchdown itself, from my point of view, was a real high in terms of elation. Not so much for the instant, but because it marked the achievement that a third of a million people had been working for a decade to accomplish. The fact that we could respond so rapidly in an eight-year period from a challenge to do something that was very nebulously understood to be able to achieve it, uh, it, it seems to, projections now seem to take a, a good bit longer, so catching up would be more difficult. Uh, so I think leadership is one where we need to be on the cutting edge to be able to, to do what we choose to do in the future. I, I, I remember uh, most vividly the, uh, the picture of the, the lunar horizon and the uh, limb ascent stage in the foreground with these two guys in it and then the earth popping up at that instant so you have all three lined up you got uh, three billion people over there two people here and that's it <laughs> That, that was special Footprints on the Moon, from produced by Harvey Jeffrey Broadbent. Birchfield and producer Harvey Since that Broadbent. program went to air, we've heard Next that the week, superpowers are talking about going back to the Moon together. That really would be a giant leap for mankind. 
Next week, stories about lost civilizations and buried treasure. Andrew Waterworth reports on the find of the century, a perfectly preserved 8,000-year-old human brain. And the people of Anasazi, whose fate serves as a timely reminder of the long-term effects of wholesale logging. That's in next week's summer edition. I hope you can join us. Until then, good night. <laughs>